Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning for colleagues from the other parts of the world who are following up through virtual, virtual platform. Uh, before I start, I will to clarify about the, our participants, our speakers. Uh, instead of uh, Justice Eliza, we'll have Professor Carlos Serra uh, from this um, institute that is the Judicial Academy in Mozambique, who has also happened to work with the University of Eduardo Mondlane in Mozambique. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, before I proceed, I would like to invite Robert here, who is, join, who is also a co-chairperson, uh, but joining us from UNEP Nairobi. Robert, can you join the forum? Just say hi to the participants. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear participants. Uh, you are all welcome. I'll be co-chairing this uh, meeting, uh, this session with uh, Justice Paul. Um, uh, we'll proceed, and uh, he'll take the lead, and I'll be joining in later. Uh, uh, later. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Uh, I wish to uh, very briefly explain about the uh, the program is the uh, His Excellency Bruno have explained this is the roundtable on judicial education on climate change and biodiversity. I will be sharing the experience of the African and the Asia. Uh, one thing I think to yesterday, today, tomorrow, and tomorrow will be we have been hearing uh, all about the a critical decade of environmental law and in particular the role of judges which is very critical when it comes to pro protection and promotion of environmental uh, environment in, in, the, in, our, in our continent and it is agreed uh, it is universally agreed that the all judges irrespective of the jurisdiction where they are their responsibility is to dispense justice without fear or favor but more important uh, that judges need to be educated. The moment that judges are not educated, that means they are not able to dispense justice without fear or favor, because uh, the judicial education is the cornerstone of independence of the judiciary, and therefore ne knowledge uh, in this respect, uh, knowledge in, in terms of environmental law is something which is indispensable, and it is very critical for us as judges, because our obligation is to understand, to know, uh, what we are judging, because we are judging in the context that we also need to, to understand. For instance, in the area of environment, uh, we were told even yesterday that it is very important for judges not only to understand the law, the environmental law, but also the science behind environmental law. So that is the reason of what we are going to discuss in the next one hour and a half, the importance of judicial education in this, in this area. Uh, having said so, I would like now to invite the, the first uh, speaker, who is Dr. Gumole Momosho. She is the Chief Executive Officer of the South African Judicial Education Institute. Uh, she has been working in this area for quite some time. Uh, the South African Judicial Education, Education Institute is the one which is hosting the network of judicial training institute in, on environmental law in, in, in Africa. So she has a lot to share. Dr. Momosho, if you are ready, uh, you can join us now. Uh, to share your presentation. Each uh, pre speaker will have 15 minutes, and after that, I will, uh, will have time to have questions from the floor. I believe that the secretary will be taking questions, and those who are joining us virtually, I'm sure you'll be able to share uh, your, your question or comments through the chat room. Dr. Mosho, you're welcome. Thank you very much, my brother. Um, good evening from South Africa. And good morning to those that um, were lucky enough to be in, in Rio. Um, I would like to start by thanking the ICUN and partners for organizing such an August international event, which serves as a platform for the judiciary and experts to exchange views and best practices on environmental issues. Let me also thank in particular, Justice Antonio Benjamin for his unwavering support 
of African judicial training institutions on advancing environmental judicial education. Judicial education is not a nice to have, but a must have for the judiciaries in the world. It prepares judicial officers to adapt. It helps them to hone their skills on a continuous basis. Although there are pockets of intransigence amongst members of the judiciary, judicial education is an established and a growing field or discipline. Hence, we are here today discussing pertinent environmental issues. Judicial education cannot cure systemic ills but it offers fresh perspectives, enhances knowledge, and polish judicial skills. Judicial training on environmental law is developing in Africa. There are ongoing initiatives towards integrating environmental law into judicial curricula. A case in point is the South African Judicial Education Institute established 10 years ago, which started a project of integrating environmental law into judicial curricula five years ago. In 2016, the Institute, in collaboration with our local Department of Environmental Affairs, hosted the first Southern African Colloquium addressing biodiversity issues which was attended by magistrates from several African countries. The participants unanimously agreed on the importance of ongoing training of members of the judiciary in Africa on environmental law. In January 2017, in partnership with the UN Environment Programme, the Institute hosted a colloquium on environmental law in Johannesburg. I would like to recognize Ms. Elizabeth Mrema for her sterling leadership, stewardship, and support for this colloquium. The colloquium was attended by 18 African and three Asian countries. The majority of the delegates were judges who were currently, who were at that time, heads of Judicial Education Institute in their respective countries. The objectives of that particular curriculum, of that particular colloquium, were to look uh, seek ways of how, to, how do we integrate environmental law into judicial curricula in Africa? How do we develop a team of trainers so that we have local expertise to deal with this area of law? How do we develop a regional curriculum on environmental law to guide judiciaries in Africa and to seek ways of, of establishing a network of judicial education institute focusing specifically on environmental law? To date, the achievements of that curriculum, of that colloquium, is that we have a cadre of judicial educators who are able to train on environmental law. We have established a network, namely the African Judicial Network on Environmental Law, commonly known as ARGENEL, in, in 2018. The network, which is under the leadership of one of our judges of the Supreme Court of Appeal, Honorable Justice Nambita Dambuza, one of the speakers of tomorrow. The network has already engaged Global Judicial Education Institute on, on Environment, on collaboration and partnership in promoting environmental training in Africa. Again, let me thank Justice Benjamin for the support. We have also developed a regional curriculum on environmental law, as well as a training manual. And our governance structures of the Arsenal, they are in place. We have, the, we have registered the, the Arsenal and the constitution is in place. We have the board 
and the Secretariat, which is hosted by the South African Judicial Education Institute. Esteemed participants, please feel free to reach out to Arjanel for any possible collaboration, partnership, as well as exchange of best practices, because together we will win. Africa is the main culprit of climate change and the most vulnerable. Climate change poses a serious risk to sustainable development in our continent. Climate change results from a number of factors such as greenhouse gases, volcanoes to a limited extent, and the use of fossil fuels. Emissions are increasing as a result of endless environmental authorization granted by our governments, not necessarily taking into consideration climate change impact. Although industrialization increases economic development, it also contributes to the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. For example, in South Africa, electricity sector contributes 41% of greenhouse gas emissions as stated by our Honorable President, uh, Cyril Ramaphos. Climate change is the most dominant topic in these times. Therefore, Training of the members of the judiciary is necessary. The South African Judicial Education Institute, in collaboration with National Judicial Institute of Canada, will be hosting an international webinar on IOJT principles of judicial training in March 2022. The discussions will include the challenges of adjudicating climate change and how to teach judges complex scientific issues. The questions are now relating to climate change for the Judicial Training Institute in Africa are, given either the paucity of knowledge on climate change in the judiciary or its complex nature, one, do we invite environment experts to train judges and magistrates? If we do, what about judicial independence? Are there enough climate change cases brought to our court by attorneys and advocates warranting environmental judicial training in respective African judiciaries? What should be the scope of the curriculum in order to enable judges and magistrates to adjudicate climate change matters? Lastly, is there a specific pedagogy applicable to judicial training on climate change? I hope that we'll be able to discuss these issues as part of these deliberations. I thank you. Over to you, Chairperson. Sir, I usually call her Dr. G for that uh, eloquent presentation. Uh, without much ado, may I now invite Christina Park, the Principal Counsel of the Asian Development Bank, to take the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, Honorable Justices, ladies and gentlemen, a warm hello from the Philippines. Um, it's just a, a great privilege to be part of this important dialogue to share the Asian experience in judicial education on climate change and environmental laws. I am grateful to the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law and the organizers for inviting the Asian Development Bank. Um, in the Asian Pacific region, um, similar to other regions, um, enhancing environmental sustainability addressing biodiversity loss and tackling climate change are key priorities for our developing member countries. But the region has serious and complex environmental and climate challenges, and the COVID pandemic has only worsened the situation. Lockdowns diminished regulatory oversight, allowing illegal hunting, logging, and animal trafficking to increase. Additionally, post 
COVID-19 stimulus packages have not prioritized green solutions. So economic recovery risks harmful knock-on impacts. And this was reported by the joint IPBVS and IPCC report earlier this year. The Asian Development Bank is well aware of the linkages between the pandemic and environmental degradation, biodiversity loss, and climate change. So we have redoubled our efforts. We are prioritizing nature-based climate appropriate investments because they are necessary building blocks for achieving the sustainable development goals. And ADB's COVID-19 recovery assistance to our developing member countries have prioritized green investments, environmental protection, and climate action. On our judicial education program, um, it began in 2010. We have been working with um, judiciaries in Asia and the Pacific with more effective and efficient adjudication of environmental disputes. And then more recently, the complex climate change disputes that have been increasing. We engage, we, are, we normally engage with the chief justices and the senior judiciary because we recognize that they have influence. Uh, they have influence on the legal systems and the environmental enforcement directly and indirectly. So over the last 10 years, with our collective efforts and sustained efforts, various courts in Asia and the Pacific have made significant progress, led by the champion chief justices and the high court judges, working together with ADB, United Nations Environment Program, IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law, Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, and other development partners. Asian courts have established green benches and green courts, judicial certification programs on environment, and promulgated environmental rules of procedure. Another important outcome has been the creation of the first of its kind Asian Judges Network on the Environment, which is a dynamic platform for judicial capacity building and multilateral exchanges on environmental adjudication. In 2018, we expanded our network to include the South Pacific judiciaries, and now we're working to engage with judges from Central Asia. Also, ADB has produced numerous knowledge resources, such as the four-part report series called Climate Change Coming to a Court Near You. It's focused on jurisprudence in the Asia and the Pacific, which is being translated into multiple languages. In this climate law report series, we chose to cover ecosystem protection litigation and biodiversity law to highlight the synergies among biodiversity conservation, climate action, and sustainable development. But perhaps the most satisfying outcome of our program is the enhancement of environmental and climate change jurisprudence. For instance, judges who have participated in ADB's programs have penned landmark judgments, such as the Laguardia versus Pakistan case, which is being cited as a precedent even beyond Asia. Again, it is only with the sustained support of judiciaries over the last 10 years that have made these achievements possible. And Asia has excellent examples of biodiversity litigation um, that apply rights, principles, and international commitments to conserve the natural world. Asian judges have explicitly commented on the linkages between ecosystem function, biodiversity conservation, climate response, and sustainable development in these decisions. So by weighing the competing needs, testing the expert evidence, courts can request or order integrated solutions. Such solutions will be fundamental for ensuring climate action and biodiversity protection do not result in unacceptable trade-offs. For example, um, in 2019, the Supreme Court of Nepal overturned the government's decision to approve a road project through the Chitwan National Park. The Chitwan National Park is in um, Nepal. Um, it's, it's, it's their wetlands, and it's one of the last refugees for the single-horned Asiatic rhinoceroses and Bengal tiger. Um, the wetlands are a UNESCO World Heritage Site and are listed under the Ransar Convention on the Wetlands. So the court treated the park status as a UNESCO World Heritage Site as a significant as significant because it implied that the Nepal's ancestors had bequeathed that heritage to the current generation. So consequently, Nepal could not harm directly or indirectly the park. 
Furthermore, Nepal has voluntarily pledged to pursue low carbon economic and social development that safeguard natural heritage under the Paris Agreement. As Nepal's Treaty Act incorporated provisions of the international instruments directly into Nepal's law, the state could not avoid its international climate and environmental commitments. Another example is the matter of Bella versus Bangladesh, a very recent case decided this year by the Supreme Court which deemed that wetland conservation is essential for humankind's survival, given that wetlands purify water. As Bangladesh is also a party to the Ramsar Convention, the court held that the government is legally obligated to immediately formulate a national policy and pass a law for wetland protection. Other orders demonstrated the court's awareness that all sectors within the Bangladesh must act in harmony and must mainstream ecocentric approaches within development plans. For example, the court stressed the importance of moving Bangladesh to 100% renewable energy. So both of these cases demonstrate the capacity of the courts to enhance climate and biodiversity governance holistically by emphasizing the linkages and the co-benefits of harmonized action. Climate and environmental litigation continue to increase globally. There are currently 1,846 climate change lawsuits around the world. The number of environmental and biodiversity protection cases is unquantified, but it's growing as well. In particular, biodiversity litigation is projected to grow. Uh, they pertain to biodiversity loss and breach of underlying legal frameworks, new regulatory rules limiting activities that have an impact on biodiversity, damages due to false reporting of biodiversity risks, and damages due to greenwashing. The new cases centered around biodiversity will likely follow the climate litigation trends. As one of the 8.7 million species on Earth, we are wreaking havoc on the natural world. Continued unsustainable exploitation of Earth's natural resource is, the, is fueling the twin crisis of climate change and biodiversity collapse. With, while these crises remain unabated, global citizens will seek their relief from the national courts, making the role of courts in climate, biodiversity, and environmental governance pivotal. So judiciaries need additional resources and tools to adjudicate these technically complex cases. It is challenging for judges to manage and understand complex scientific evidence, especially in many developing countries that lack the court procedures or the technology for conducting virtual hearings. Furthermore, many petitions call for courts to intervene in policy or review or set targets for climate emissions or for biodiversity conservation. And this blurs the lines between judicial and executive functions of the government. During this crucial time of complex development landscape, it is even more critical that development banks such as the ADB continue to support our judiciaries and provide them with the resources and the networks to help navigate the new complexities associated with climate and environmental litigation. So I am delighted to report that the ADB launched the next phase of our judicial capacity building program this year. Under this new technical assistance, we have taken a cross-sector thematic approach and have included commercial components due to the convergence of environmental and climate change issues. Indeed, sustainable development considerations are integral to the operations and governance of corporations and financial institutions, and sustainable investments are increasing. Furthermore, the complexity of resolving environmental and climate litigation means that judges need support with devising appropriate remedies. So one of our key initiatives is to develop and publish a model remedial orders handbook for Asia Pacific judges, which will include selected orders from key environment and climate cases, which the judges can use to generate ideas for appropriate remedies, and they can tailor it for their legal system and national context. We are also seeking to deepen our collaboration with regional bodies, such as ASEAN, APEC, CARIC, and SARC, to institutionalize our judicial capacity building programs to foster systematic and sustainable opportunities for judicial education. Moreover, strengthening judicial networks will continue to be an important focus for the ADB, and we will continue to support the Asian and the Pacific ju Judges Network on the Environment and bring in more judges into this network. So I'd like to end 
by thanking the international environmental law community. ADB's judicial program has greatly benefited from the collaboration with the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law, the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, and UN Environment Program, as well as other partners. Their tremendous knowledge and global network of experts and judges have enriched our judicial program and knowledge sharing and cooperation in Asia and the Pacific. So we look forward to continuing our partnerships to support our judiciaries during these challenging times. And thank you so much for including the ABB in this critical dialogue. Thank you very much, Christina Park, for the uh, the, that uh, elaborated explanation of the role that the ADB have played in capacity building of judicial education on environment and climate in the Asian Pacific region. We are very delighted to see that the ADB is doing uh, great in, the, in that area. And now, without wasting time, uh, may I now kindly invite another speaker, and that is none other than Professor Carlos Cicera, uh, Professor Carlos Cicera is an environmental lecturer and researcher at the Judicial Academy of Mozambique. He also uh, teaches at the University of Eduardo Mondlane in the same country in, in Mozambique. Uh, Professor, you are welcome. Muito boa tarde, é uma honra estar neste evento. Conheço alguns participantes e para mim será também uma oportunidade de aprender muito. Falo-vos a partir do norte de Moçambique. Uh, onde decorre uma reunião sobre lixo marinho uh, e da qual tive que sair para estar uh, convosco. Uh, eu vou procurar ser breve em 15 minutos e contar um pouco e partilhar um pouco a experiência do que tem sido trabalhar no direito do ambiente, a política judiciária que a instituição em Moçambique responsável pela formação no setor da justiça, em particular, portanto, os nossos mestrados judiciais e do Ministério Público, que foi criado em 1997 e instalado em 2000 na cidade da Matola, portanto, perto de, da nossa capital. Mas também do facto de ser docente na Universidade Eduardo Mondelano, mais concretamente na Faculdade de Direito, onde sou atualmente coordenador de um centro de direito do ambiente, da biodiversidade e da qualidade de vida. Mas gostaria de começar dizendo que o nosso CFJJ, ele iniciou uh, as suas atividades no ano 2000, portanto, cerca de três meses depois de um, de um fenómeno muito triste que ocorreu, que foram as cheias uh, de 2000, que basicamente portanto, afetaram toda a região sul do país, uh, vitimaram cerca de 800 pessoas e causaram danos em aproximadamente 500 milhões de dólares. Deixaram profundas marcas no nosso território, deixaram um legado, portanto, que dura até hoje, e foi para nós um exercício também difícil começar a trabalhar esta matéria três meses depois, mas também foi uma oportunidade, porque o acidente, o incidente estava tão próximo, as memórias estavam tão próximas, que realmente esta questão ambiental esta questão climática, começaram a, a ganhar alguns espaços. Uh, o que aconteceu uh, na instituição foi muito interessante, portanto, criada no setor da justiça, portanto, tutelada uh, pelo nosso ministro da justiça, ela começou muito jovem, desde logo uma abordagem inovadora, portanto, nós fizemos a formação uh, do judiciário, quer na formação inicial, portanto, uma nova geração de magistrados, que é na capacitação dos mestrados existentes e dos mestrados, entretanto, formados, que necessitavam sempre de, de, de novos conteúdos ou de, ou de trabalhar conteúdos adquiridos, melhorar conteúdos adquiridos, que era ainda na componente de investigação. Portanto, nós sempre trabalhámos a formação e a investigação e foi muito bom porque a investigação alimentou a formação e vice-versa quer ainda também através da produção de material pedagógico, portanto, quer coletando a legislação, e na altura tínhamos um déficit muito grande no acesso à informação jurídica, uh, e nós produzimos as primeiras coletâneas de legislação do país, portanto, em série, abrangendo os mais diversos setores do, do direito, e, e logicamente, porque considerámos desde a primeira hora o direito ao ambiente uma prioridade, uh, passou a fazer parte do nosso currículo, portanto, desde 2000, desde o primeiro curso de formação inicial de mestrados, que esta área consta no currículo 
no Centro de Formação Jurídica Judiciária. Uh, devo dizer que já lá vão 20 anos, portanto, se estamos neste momento, 21 anos, estamos neste momento a, a trabalhar com o vigésimo curso de ingresso e o, o programa integra sempre, um pouco, que acho muito importante ainda a, a contar alguns aspectos interessantes. Nós entendemos na altura que o centro não devia ser uma réplica das universidades, Portanto, eram muito menos, na altura tínhamos muito menos estabelecimentos do ensino superior relativamente a hoje. A oferta era muito produzida de, de, de licenciados em direito ao centro. Mas entendemos desde a primeira hora que nós deveríamos, logicamente, ancorar daí métodos ativos, uh, deveríamos bem uh, procurar sempre uma formação que uh, se refletir em torno de repensar o próprio direito e tivesse, sem dúvida, uma componente forte de pluralismo jurídico. Isto foi muito importante para que a componente de direitos do ambiente, ela própria também se também no princípio do pluralismo jurídico. Então, desde o início que nós introduzimos, uma componente muito prática, que era incutir em cada formando e futuro magistrado uh, um pouco da realidade que tínhamos no terreno. Nós sabíamos que havia muito poucos casos em tribunal e, e era necessário, uh, obviamente, inverter esta tendência. Era necessário que esses casos chegassem ao judiciário, que, no, que o nosso judiciário tivesse uma intervenção mais ativa. No entanto, era muito importante intervir uh, nesta componente prática. Então, começámos a levar os nossos formandos à realidade. Introduzimos algumas visitas de estudo que fizeram, ficaram na memória de muitos até hoje. Portanto, era para o estudo, sempre uma visita ao maior lixeira que nós temos no país, que está dentro da área metropolitana de Maputo, que é uma, é uma viagem ao, ao, ao inferno, mas que é fundamental para compreender o que significa uh, o mundo da poluição, o mundo também da desigualdade, o mundo também do... do, 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 do do, do flagelo social enorme em que muitas vezes uh, se encontram, isso colocava os nossos profissionais a pensar seriamente no que poderiam um dia ter que fazer numa, numa intervenção daquela natureza. Tivemos também o cuidado de levar os nossos formandos muito cedo, portanto, e esta rotina mantém-se até hoje, a visitar um spot, uma, uma zona ecologicamente sensível, eventualmente ameaçada, pressionada, Uh, ou havendo condições para tal, a uma área de conservação mais próxima. Portanto, foi fundamental, porque nós já tínhamos muitos jovens uh, nascidos na cidade, completamente alheios àquilo que é a dimensão da natureza, e atenção, à medida que as cidades crescem, há uma tendência a estarmos mais distantes da natureza. Foi muito importante visitar áreas de conservação, e isto fez com que os nossos futuros magistrados lavassem, portanto, o ambiente no, no próprio coração. Nas áreas ecologicamente sensíveis, particularmente na zona urbana, nós começámos a lidar com a temática das mudanças climáticas muito cedo, porque parte destes ecossistemas eles são essenciais na construção de uma resiliência. O crescimento desordenado das nossas cidades, a dependência de biomassa, faz muitas vezes com que se corte o mangal, portanto, se destrua a terra úmida, a, a, a floresta costeira aumentando a vulnerabilidade a um ciclone, a uma inundação portanto a qualquer fenómeno climático extremo. Em 2001 nós tivemos portanto uma, 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 uma experiência muito boa com a entrada em cena de, de um parceiro que foi a FAO nas Nações Unidas, Programa Mundial para a, 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 para a Alimentação e, 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 e Agricultura e este, este, este parceiro Portanto, na altura apoiado pelo Reino dos Países Baixos, este passeio iniciou connosco um ciclo que, que teve, na realidade, quatro projetos, todos eles com uma linha de contribuir para a implementação da legislação do ambiente e afins, uh, portanto, tendo como componente também o reforço da intervenção do judiciário. E durante cerca de 12 anos nós tivemos uma oportunidade de trabalhar em todo o país, portanto, realizando ações de capacitação e aqui entraram em cena novos atores. Portanto, a nossa preocupação foi não apenas abranger todos os juízes e procuradores que não tinham uh, beneficiado de formação inicial ou de qualquer capacitação, mas também, dada a importância para a implementação da legislação, os oficiais da polícia, portanto, os comandantes distritais da polícia, os administradores de áreas de conservação, 
uh, os diretores distritais de atividades económicas uh, e num curso muito específico de capacitação, os agentes paralegais, portanto, que estão uh, em contato com as comunidades e trabalham com as comunidades na divulgação da legislação. Portanto, e durante muitos anos nós trabalhamos nesta, neste, neste fortalecimento da nossa capacidade uh, de dar a conhecer uh, este quadro legal novo, a Lei do Ambiente data de 1997, a Lei de Florestas de 1999, a Lei de Terras de 1997 também. Entretanto, portanto, conseguimos contribuir a que o país entre, já estava a sofrer com, 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 a, com a crise de, do, do crescimento da caça furtiva, particularmente na busca de troféus, portanto estamos a falar do abate de rinocerontes e de, e de elefantes, e portanto e do tráfico associado, portanto o centro teve a possibilidade também de contribuir para uh, alimentar a primeira lei de conservação do país, lei esta que foi aprovada em 2014. Uh, e, portanto, e pela primeira vez uh, na história do nosso país, nós uh, incluímos no texto legal infrações de natureza criminal, portanto os crimes contra uh, a fauna bravia estão lá constantes. Uh, e esta lei veio ser, três anos mais tarde, também com o apoio de profissionais uh, formados pelo centro, foi a ser revista e fortalecida, portanto, em 2017, a lei de conservação tem também sido bastante divulgada pelo, com o apoio do Centro de Formação Jurídica e Judiciária a todos os profissionais que não beneficiaram de, de, da, sua, da sua ação. Portanto, tem sido um historial muito interessante em que uh, antigos formandos no Centro de Formação Jurídica e Judiciária acabam depois também liderando processos que contribuem para uma melhor aplicação da lei. Ora, isto, isto no que diz respeito ao centro de formação, portanto, poderia terminar por aqui. No que diz respeito à universidade, portanto, o nosso papel tem sido lidar com candidatos a licenciados em Direito e a disciplina de Direito do Ambiente, curiosamente, ela foi inserida no currículo das universidades muito cedo também. Portanto, em Moçambique, ao contrário de grande parte dos países do mundo, ela faz parte, ela integra o plano curricular básico da licenciatura em Direito. Portanto, quase a totalidade de instituições de ensino superior lecionam o direito do ambiente. Não quero com isso dizer que, que a qualidade seja a melhor, mas o que é certo é que os nossos licenciados em direito chegam ao centro de formação jurídica e judiciária já com a disciplina de direito do ambiente. Portanto, isso constitui também uma vantagem. Onde é que está o nosso maior desafio? É que nós estamos a intervir já muito à frente de um processo o país tem uma lacuna muito grande em matéria ambiental, que é a lacuna básica, da educação ambiental básica. Portanto, há uma escassez enorme no programa curricular na, no ensino primário, no ensino secundário, no ensino técnico ou profissional. Portanto, é quase certo que, que nós encontremos licenciados em direito com muito baixa ou nula consciência ambiental. Já quase a terminar, portanto, nos últimos anos temos vindo a fortalecer a nossa abordagem climática. Portanto, comecei com 2000 e eu diria que quando em 2019 nós enfrentámos num único ano dois ciclones que deixaram estragos acima do, dos estragos deixados pelas cheias de 2000, portanto, um na região centro e daí um na região norte, o Kennedy, nós verificámos realmente a necessidade que temos todos de trabalhar em todas as frentes, não apenas como país, mas a nível global, nesta questão das mudanças climáticas. No caso de Moçambique, temos que fortalecer, logicamente, a resiliência. E este fortalecimento da resiliência passa por muitos aspectos, incluindo o aspecto legal, o aspecto da, do, da, da aprovação de leis boas, leis eh, claramente dirigidas a fortalecer esta, esta resiliência, pela divulgação destes instrumentos legais, que muitas vezes nós não conseguimos depois dar esse salto, que é dar a conhecer o bom quadro legal que vamos aprovando e depois contribuir todos para o fortalecimento, para a implementação deste mesmo quadro legal. Portanto, e o ano passado, em plena pandemia do Covid-19, contribuímos para a nova lei de gestão e redução do risco de desastres, que contém uma forte abordagem climática e que coloca também um papel e uma responsabilidade no nosso judiciário. Portanto, neste momento, o Centro de Formação Jurídica Judiciária, que entretanto conta também com o apoio do UNEP, tem sido muito importante esse apoio até na uniformização do nosso currículo, e estamos a considerar uh, este aspecto como prioritário, mas consideramos muito importante que nos próximos anos nós dediquemos cada vez mais atenção à formação do nosso judiciário na componente climática, dada a natureza e a importância do assunto, a gravidade também e a sensibilidade também. 
portanto, para, mesmo para terminar, portanto, o, o, atualmente nós encontramos num processo de desenvolver agora conteúdos que visem responder a, esta, a este desafio climático, portanto, a esta agenda climática que é muito importante, visto que em relação à conservação de biodiversidade estamos, estamos num bom caminho, mas em relação à questão climática é fundamental, até porque estamos a perder verdadeiros spots de, 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 importantes na construção da resiliência, estamos altamente dependentes da biomassa, portanto estamos a perder muita floresta e temos que encontrar soluções. Este era o meu, as minhas considerações finais e obrigado. Bom dia, obrigado. Thank you very much, professor. Uh, that was uh, interesting. And my apologies for cutting you short. It's because we wanted to keep within the time schedule that we've been allocated with the party, with the organizers. Uh, having said that now, with the, for the interest of time, I would like to invite the last speaker, but not least in terms of, of priority. And that is uh, Sandra Nicom uh, Tom, an associate vice president and Director of uh, Judicial Education uh, on the Environmental Law Institute, that is ELI, which is based in Washington, D.C. I think those who were uh, in the meeting yesterday, uh, she was one of the those who uh, contributed. Uh, may I invite you, uh, Sandra to join us and thank uh, you. are welcome. Thank you so much, Justice Kiwelo. It's a pleasure to be with this distinguished panel, and I wanted to say how glad I am to be participating as ELI's representative to the World Commission on Environmental Law at this really important time in the history of the commission um, and continuing our engagement that dates back uh, at least until the 1980s. I also wanted to comment, and I'm glad Justice Kiwelo raised it, um, on just how excited I've been first hearing from my co-panelists, um, but in particular, um, hearing uh, some of the news coming from the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment meeting yesterday. I want to take the opportunity to congratulate Justice Antonio Benjamin on where that group has, has come um, after so much work. Um, and I'm so excited about the potential of that group. And in particular, listening to all the judges talk about their, their goals um, and, and where they see the priorities for DJIE, I just couldn't, couldn't, kept getting more and more excited, you know, I kept thinking, yes, that's what we need to do. And yes, that's what we're prepared to do. And that's what we'd like to do with you. So um, it's just a pleasure to be engaging with this group, even if um, remotely. As Justice Kuelu mentioned, um, I work for the Environmental Law Institute and we're a research and education uh, institute in Washington, based in Washington, DC, but we work with partners around the world. Our goal is to advance environmental and human rights objectives using rule of law. To, the, to us, this means in, engaging the proper engagement of stakeholders in this process. And so across all of our work, we engage with communities and NGOs and all different government institutions and others to enable them to advance their objectives using environmental law and governance. In particular, our judicial education program also follows this method or this approach. We were formed at the dawn of the modern environmental legal era to foster the development of environmental science and law to advance societal goals. Over the past 50 plus years, we've worked with many different kinds of groups. And early on in our history, a federal judge in the United States asked ELI to help build the capacity of the judiciary on environmental law and environmental topics. Since that time, we've worked with judiciaries and judicial education institutes and others in 28 countries across the world to support them in devising education programs to meet their goals. Our programs have touched on a broad range of topics, but have included comparative legal experiences, principles of environmental law, and related topics um, outside the law, such as economics of natural resource damages, and um, specific scientific topics or biology topics, for example. Today, we all we all agree, and we all we all are focused on the top societal imperative of reaching zero greenhouse gas emissions and preparing for climate impacts. So, in response to increasing demand from judges for training related to climate change and the trends in climate litigation. 
In 2019, the Environmental Law Institute launched the Climate Judiciary Project. In many ways, this, this project fits in the mold of ELI's traditional judicial education methodology. We work with judicial education institutions in developing the programs. We are, our content responds to requests um, that we've gotten from the judges and, and is developed with feedback from judges. Um, but with this program, we've shifted the emphasis. This program is about climate science with the legal aspects coming to reinforce the science focus. We're connecting the scientific community with the judiciary. The great leap that we as society are called upon to make to meet the challenge of climate change requires an understanding of what we're up against and how to deal with the information relevant to these changes. As Justice Coelho said, we must know what we are judging. So while climate science is built on very well-established scientific understanding from basic scientific disciplines that stretch back hundreds and hundreds of years, the consensus that excess greenhouse gases are driving dangerous warming has really come together in the last 30 years to the point of being unequivocal today. But this science is moving fast. And at the cutting edge, scientists are now able to unpack the role that these changes play even in individual extreme events. So the point is the science is developing quickly um, and in order to keep up with it and be able to deal appropriately, the law has to keep up with it as well. While appropriate policy responses to the climate challenge are still extremely controversial in many places, our program brings consensus science from mainstream scientific institutions like the IPCC to judges and the judiciary. We conducted a series of pilot programs with federal and state judges across the United States. And based on that experience, we are developing a curriculum, a written curriculum that will include uh, background papers, slide decks, and other teaching materials for training judges on climate science and related trends um, in, in climate litigation. And we've trained a cohort of scientists to teach this curriculum to judges. Um, my colleague, Bob Malemu, raised the, the interesting and important point about how do we bring together scientists to engage with judges and that there are certain norms about how judges can engage in education programs. So that's something that we have experience with, and we have developed a cohort of scientists who can appropriately play that role. We've been um, we've done this program with close to 500 judges in the United States, um, and it's been a success and the, the project is really ramping up. Um, but we're now really excited to say that we're speaking with the GJIE about how to adapt our material and work with judiciaries around the world to develop education programs on climate science in order to contribute to the global response to this challenge. After all, the science is universal. Our goal is to help countries keep their Paris commitments and comply with the Glasgow Pact. So uh, in discussion with GJIE and others, we're interested in finding places and partners where science education can help make a meaningful contribution to the enhancement of climate change jurisprudence. I very much hope we have time for some discussion because part of um, what we're looking for is to, to find out more about what others are doing and, and find potential collaborations. Um, so thank you so much for this opportunity and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Sandra, for saving time. In fact, you've spent uh, less minute than the time that you've been allocated to you. And that gives us more time for discussion uh, from our colleagues who are following us uh, through virtual platform and those who are with, with us here in, in Rio. I think the take home message from all the presenters uh, we've heard from our um, our incredible speakers uh, from the different parts of the world who have shared uh, in, is to what is happening in the field of judicial education on climate change and biodiversity. I think there's a lot to unpack from what they've uh, pointed out. But more important, I think the, uh, the emphasis was uh, the time to act is now. And if you want judges to act, then uh, judicial education actually is inevitable. We have to go for it. And these are issues that of, uh, I think, the uh, the, uh, the the global judicial uh, education uh, the global judicial environment uh, 
I think that the institute is very important uh, in that sphere, uh, working also with other, other partners. So I think now I'll, uh, I'll invite uh, uh, comments, uh, intervention from the floor, as well as those who are following us through the virtual platform. Um, I'm not sure whether they are. Yeah, I'm, I'm informed by this uh, by Nick that there are no uh, no comments or questions from the platform from the. Uh, from the chat room, and now I'll invite the participants who are sitting before me, and I, th I can see uh, Justice Antonio is eager. Uh, welcome, Justice Antonio. Well, many thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Muito obrigado. Eu queria apenas felicitar o, os excelentes expositores que nos apresentaram uma visão comparada da educação judicial em matéria de meio ambiente e, e de direito das mudanças climáticas. E queria, em particular, agradecer a nossa querida Cristina Pac, porque agora em Manila são duas horas, quase três horas da manhã. Isso é um esforço extraordinário que eu faço questão é, de reconhecer. Também é, já é noite na África, em Washington nós estamos praticamente no mesmo fuso horário. Mas esse é um tema da mais alta relevância quando nós nos reunimos como juízes porque o direito ambiental demanda formação específica. Nós juízes não, não nascemos ou nos tornamos juízes com conhecimento profundo de direito ambiental. E as escolas judiciais do mundo todo, inclusive as do Brasil, da América Latina como um todo, estão se debruçando sobre essa temática. Então eu quero apenas festejar as intervenções aqui apresentadas e também o nosso uh, presidente uh, aqui presente, uh, que é ele próprio diretor de uma escola judicial na Tanzânia. E o nosso colega uh, do PNUMA, do UNEP, Robert Wabunova, que tem liderado na África este, este trabalho de, de juntar as várias experiências de um continente tão grande e tão complexo pela diversidade de línguas, e pelas distâncias e de sistemas jurídicos. Esse trabalho do PNUMA é absolutamente notável. E eu, então, deixo os meus parabéns ao nosso uh, colega Robert Wabnova. Muito obrigado. Thank you, Justice uh, Antonio, for the, for the comment, which is a valid comment, actually, that comes from Africa. And Africa is very complex. Uh, from the north, where it's, uh, it's mainly Arab, you come to the west, there are lots of uh, the French speaking. And of course, in East Africa, it's English and Swahili. You go to, uh, to uh, some Portuguese speaking countries. So there are, very, there are lots of diversity in, in Africa. And of course, we are very happy that our colleagues from UNEP actually have been able to bring us together, especially the Portuguese. Uh, speaking and the, uh, the, the, the English speaking, and we were able to build, uh, to come up with the curriculum that have been pointed out. And may I now invite others from the floor? Uh, yes, uh, Professor Denise. Thank you, and thank you for the excellent presentations. My question to all of you who are on the panel involved in judicial education is, I would love to know your techniques for dealing with turnover on the bench as new judges are constantly coming onto the bench or leaving the bench. 
what are what's your best advice for um, keeping up with that constant inflow and outflow of judges? So I would love to hear some practical implementation uh, tips that you have for dealing with that uh, those transitions and making sure there's a consistent level of education. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Can we hear from a uh, uh, response from the from the speakers? Sandra, do you have any comment on that? Thank you, for, Denise, for that question. It's actually a really interesting question, um, and it's one that's pretty hard for outside institutions to get a handle on. Um, but I think um, we've been able to come up with two ways um, to at least partially address that. I don't think it's possible to keep everybody at the same level. I mean, of course, the, each judge will always be different and come with whatever background they come with. But um, we are uh, currently working with um, a ju judicial education institution here in the United States, the National Judicial College, to um, select judges who are um, from each state judiciary who are particularly interested in the issue of climate change and actually will be working with them over the course of a year to develop their knowledge of climate change issues and the science and the law, um, as well as their leadership skills with the objective of having them go back and sort of a train the trainers or decentralization approach um, because the goal is to have those uh, judicial leaders go back to their states and figure out how they can continue the learning and advance um, the education on these topics in their judiciary. So that doesn't exactly solve the problem, but hopefully it uh, further disseminates the learning and reaches more, um, more participants. I guess another aspect of what we're doing is writing down the curriculum so it will be available to judges. So even if judges aren't able to attend a program, um, if they're interested, they'll be able to read the curriculum. Um, I think there may be other thoughts I had, but um, let me pass it to others to see if they wanted to respond as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Dr. G, uh, do you have some quick intervention on that question? I, I, not really the, the technique that will solve the problem, but I'll just share what, what happens in South Africa in terms of training of judges. Unfortunately, here yeah, we can only train judges uh, during recess periods, which is um, almost twice a year. But also, I think I need to mention that at respective courts, uh, there's peer learning that is taking place at, 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 at respective courts. So we're just hoping that um, that peer learning and transfer of skills um, helps to to build capacity at 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 at, uh, at uh, those respective courts um, i know that's not the the solution but that's that's what we do um in in my country thank you christina do you have a comment um yes um just just to add to that i mean we struggle with this as well and um from our perspective as you know a donor um bank um, I mean, one key thing we try to do is um, leverage other partners. That way there is consistent um, delivery of um, training because, you know, the, there, we find that there's um, ad hoc approaches and ad hoc interventions. So there's, uh, you know, bits and pieces of capacity building that different donors do. But I think we need to pull our resources together to make sure that we can deliver um, a programmatic and holistic uh, program for the judges. I guess in terms of, you know, we struggle with sustainability of, of our, our judicial programs as well. And that that's uh, one of the reasons that we're working to um, integrate it into the judicial um, academy or judicial schools curriculum. So we're trying to work with their schedule because judges are extremely busy, time poor people, and we don't want to add any more burden. Um, but um, by integrating it into the um, existing, you know, traditional curriculum, it kind of, um, you know, helps with their time management and also for us to kind of um, provide them with, um, you know, relevant and, um, you know, timely um, topics and materials that they need to better adjudicate. Um, I, I guess, uh, you know, another, I mean, the, Another thing we do struggle with is that there's no one size fits all because different judges have different, um, you know, they come with different um, backgrounds. 
Um, and of course, different courts have different jurisdictions and have, uh, you know, different things. So, so it's, it's, it, it is challenging. So I think the main message, and I'll start with the main message is that we, we all need to work together. And I think, uh, global judicial institutes like GJIE will really help us pool the resources and better manage the delivery of judicial education globally. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh... I'll reserve Professor Carlo. Yeah. I'll come with, uh, with you for another. And I'm told there's a question. Uh, yeah. uh, did you want to chip in, Professor? OK. OK. Uh, obrigado. Não, basicamente, para acrescentar, no caso de Moçambique, nós temos uma associação de juízes muito ativa, muito dinâmica, composta por, por a juventude, por jovens que um dia foram formando neste Centro de Formação Jurídica Judiciária e que têm tido um papel muito interessante Uh, no acompanhamento das novas realidades jurídicas, portanto, um papel de, até de responsabilidade social que, que, que é promissor e que tem feito um complemento essencial na formação jurídica e judiciária. Portanto, alguns destes jovens profissionais têm sido uh, atuantes na formação nas províncias, portanto, tornando também uh, esta formação mais sustentável, porque é impossível nós conseguirmos cobrir toda, todo o território e todas as necessidades, uh, e permanentemente uh, as necessidades que nós temos de formação. Obrigado. We have uh, one question online from Justice Mansoor Ali Shah from Pakistan. Please, Justice Mansoor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this excellent presentation, Sandra. Uh, my question is that uh, this judicial training, uh, the the training for the judges in our, in our country, most of the work on climate justice or perhaps planetary justice in future, the trendsetters are the constitutional court judges, which would be the Supreme Court or the High Court. So I was just very curious that we, we don't really see a program for the Supreme Court judges or the High Court or the constitutional court judges. Most of the programs in the academies are structured around for the tribunal judges or, or, or the courts, lower courts. So how do we go about in getting involved, get involving the Supreme Court judges? Because we can't just depend on some champions here or there to move the agenda. We need to have a large base of constitutional court judges really doing this. But as I see around also, you just find one of one or two judges in, you know, the con in countries that we're talking about at the constitutional level who, who really perhaps driven by their passion for the environment or the climate themselves. But it isn't, the momentum isn't building as, as if, you know, the whole court is interested. You just find one off person in the court uh, at the Supreme Court or the High Court. So how, how, how does judicial education, you know, get that momentum going at the constitutional court level? Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Really fascinating. Um, and it's something we think about all the time. And I do have to say that um, as an American thinking about our Supreme Court, it's, it's a little it's a little embarrassing, um, the situation. But um, uh, one point is that, in fact, um, while we haven't done any programs for our Supreme Court, um, the first set of pilot programs that we did was with our Federal Judicial Center, which is the administrative agency that manages all of our federal courts and is actually managed by a governing board that's chaired by our Chief Justice of our Supreme Court. So Chief Justice John Roberts knows about and has approved our curriculum. Um, so at least in that sense, he's aware of it. Um, that doesn't get to your question of actually, you know, engaging and sharing information with the judges. Um, but we've also, we have, through that, we've been able to do, and again, this is different in every every country, but um, we've done a number of programs with appellate court judges, which could likely one day be chosen or, you know, other levels of federal court judges, which might eventually go up to being at the Supreme Court, at least in our system. Um, and I, I mean, I don't see I don't see any um, sort of fundamental reason why the education couldn't be with Supreme Courts. If somebody in the judiciary is deciding that this is a priority why why wouldn't the the um, high court um, engage in the program? And maybe there would be a need to do a special program for that court because of the norms of how different courts, the issues they're interested in or the norms of engaging with different courts. Um, but tell me about the experience, your experience and your perspective on it, um, because I'd like to understand better what the obstacles you see are. Uh, 
Well, thank you. Uh, you see, the, there is a problem. Uh, the initiative will not come from the judiciary because the initiative has to come from the educationists. It could either come from the academy, uh, but the academy isn't around the Supreme Court judges because, uh, you know, the High Court and Supreme Court judges, uh, are, are, they don't go through any training program as such in our country. So that is a problem. And I've been thinking about this for several years, that how do we get other judges involved? I thought the Global Judicial Institute is, is an excellent platform because we have judges from all over the world. And maybe at some stage we need to think that how could we possibly intervene and, and train some of our colleagues and judges around the world. But it is an important area because the, the most of the important jurisprudence developing in, in our region is from the Constitution Court, actually. And I, I, I wonder that, you know, if you don't have these champions sitting in these courts, uh, how tomorrow is going to look like. So that scares me. Because I, I don't really see a cadre developing uh, into this area. So, yes, I, I don't have an answer. And I keep thinking how to get them involved. I mean, no, thank you, Matt. Uh, yes. Just, uh, just to add briefly, it's a cultural issue and we all have to be vigilant. We all have to be looking for pathways to reach people. I mean, we haven't done a training for our Supreme Court, but we, we have some ideas about how we might be able to reach them. So, I mean, I think we all just have to in our cultures and in our systems, be vigilant for these opportunities. Thanks for raising that point. Yeah, I think you yeah. quite agree that uh, the judicial education actually, in the past, judges were not really yeah. to be trained or to be educated. But increasingly, I think things are changing. So I think it's, it's, it's almost everywhere. In some of our jurisdiction now, we are training even judges of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Apex Court. They are able actually to sit and be trained. It also includes judges of the regional courts. So some of them actually have come from the from these superior courts in our own country. Dr. G, did you have anything to comment? Yes, um, in South Africa, judges of the Supreme Court of Appeal, they do attend training. Some of them are trainers themselves. But um, we are in the same situation like all over the world. Uh, constitutional court judges don't attend. Um, so it's something, I guess, that needs um, some kind of attention. And I think they've also the problem is that the the training is it's um it's not compulsory in our country, so yeah, so that cultural uh, issue that um, Christina or you know, Sandra referred to, we all suffer from it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's a matter of time. Uh, what is impossible today may be possible tomorrow, so we should keep our actual trying. Uh, we may be able to break the grass. Any other comment from the floor? Uh, there's another comment, I think, from Christina. Oh, yeah, no, I was just going to comment on um, Justice Shaw's comment about, um, you know, um, countries um, where rights-based litigation is very prevalent. Um, there is definitely a need to uh, train up the constitutional judges. But, you know, I, in our experience um, working in different countries, it, it really depends on the relationship um, between the Supreme Court and the Judicial Academy as well. Um, because um, sometimes there's good cooperation and sometimes there, there is, um, um, it, it takes some time to actually coordinate at both sides. Um, but in smaller countries, we have seen the Supreme Court justices um, attend our training program. So it really depends, but there is a clear need, um, especially in, um, with all the rights-based litigation increasing. So I totally, totally agree with Justice Shaw that there is a need. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christina, for that intervention. I see there's no hand from the floor, and there's no comment from the chat room. And I, we, I think we have 80 minutes left, so maybe I, I should I invite Robert, if you are with us, can you join us uh, for a quick comment as you've been following up this, this, this discussion as a co-chair? Robert Obno, if Robert is not there to join us, I'll, let me take this opportunity. Um, yes, Robert. I um, uh, have, uh, have come in. Yeah, um, thank you, dear participants, judges. Um, uh, what I see from where I sit in the United Nations Environment Program is that the, we constantly need to try new methods, to try uh, new ways 
it keep on trying and keep on trying because there are no permanent solutions to this issue. Uh, that is one. Two, um, what I'm also seeing uh, from where I sit is that uh, we need to continuously build uh, partnerships for judicial training. Uh, no one, no one country, no one judiciary has all the solutions or the best solutions on how to handle these matters. And, and therefore, when you exchange with uh, colleagues, with other jurisdictions, even across continents and so on, uh, you end up uh, building a stronger, sustainable tra judicial training uh, programs and activities. Uh, to me, where I stand, that is what I've been seeing. And, uh, and I think uh, many people have brought up that issue and so on. And so on. That is uh, my parting message uh, to all the part participants. Uh, back to you, Paul. Okay, thank you, Robert, for those uh, good words, uh, which uh, encourages us actually to keep on working. And as some, one of our participants have said, uh, there's nothing one uh, one size fits all. So every jurisdiction have a different way, but we need we are we stand to learn from each other, and that is the beauty actually of us coming together. There's a lot that we can learn from each other, and I guess there's a lot that uh, each of us each of us are uh, there to benefit. And platforms like the DJE and others, I think they're also a wonderful opportunity for us to to engage. Uh, with that note, I wish to. Uh, Sincere, uh, register my appreciation to the organizers for trusting me uh, to be sitting at this particular moment to chair the session. And thank you very much, of course, also for bringing me up uh, from Africa. Besides the the difficult moments, we are all we all understand this is. I was telling participants that initially it was a. Uh, the, the hassle of traveling was to a terrorism issues. So the security measures that one was going through was a hassle by itself. So now there's this additional uh, hassle of the COVID, but we are glad to be together actually. Parting, uh, uh, being together, I think physically means a lot. Thank you very much for all the organizers. Thank you for colleagues from Brazil. It's always uh, nice to be back in Brazil. It is very unfortunate that I cannot speak in Portuguese, but next time I'm here, I'm going to learn in Portuguese. And tomorrow I'm going to learn how to dance at night. Thank you very much, and uh, let me call it. Thank you very much for being with us.